Welcome back to Questions for the Rector. I'm Stephen Heiner, and with us is the Rector of Most Holy Trinity Seminary, His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn. Hello, Your Excellency. Hello, Stephen. So today we're going to talk about the the dead. It's November now, and one of the questions we got on X when I asked for more questions for the Rector for this series was, what steps are necessary for faithful to take to ensure that they get extreme unction, uh, Catholic burial, Catholic mass. And I just, myself, just from anecdotally, I've seen many times over the years where this has been fumbled. And I'm sure you, you have even many oh, more, many more times. Great deal. So what, what do Catholic laymen need to know in order to handle this? The first thing I would say is that they should move to a place in which priests are in proximity, close proximity. And many people do not observe that. Now, obviously, not everyone can move, but today people are pretty mobile with regard to moving. And just as you would never move to a place in which there is no water, so also you should never move to a place in which there are no priests. The priests are more important to you than water, uh, as far as the Mass, as far as the instruction, and also being assisted in dying. St. Thomas Aquinas, when asked by his sister, what is the most important thing in life? He said, a good death. So typical, that's all he said. Typical answer from that, St. Thomas. That's all he said. A good death is the most important thing in life. And so looking, some people move to these you know, areas that are beautiful and this and that. You know, They have other motives for moving to places. But they don't think about their eternal life. They don't think about what happens when they die. No priest is going to go out to, you know, or it might take him hours to get out to, say, like the the, the uh, canyon lands of Utah because they're so beautiful. Uh, they, but it might take him hours to get there. You could be dead for hours by the time he gets there. So when you say in proximity, do you mean a two or three hour drive max? At the most. At the most. At the most. You can, you know, if you have a heart attack or a stroke, you might go very quickly. Okay. Aneurysm. So that's step one, move someplace within yes. proximity. Yes, and you know, the priest has to get out. You know, you call him, he has to get out. It he has to find all of his things to do everything correctly. It might take him 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, even just to get out the door. Uh, and uh, uh, so it, it's, it's very important. Uh, and the priest can anoint up to two hours after actual death. So that, and the reason for that is that the soul is not considered to have left the body uh, until that time, unless there's a violent, very violent death, like a decapitation, something like that, uh, dismemberment, then uh, where, see, the, the idea is that if you die, say, from a stroke or from just old age, the body is still uh, disposed to retain the soul for a while until the body starts corrupting so much that the soul can no longer stay. Uh, so that's why, as a rule, you have up to two hours. Uh, so, uh, and that, that often is the case. Sometimes you arrive after someone is actually, you might say, clinically dead. They're not really dead until the soul has left the body. Mm -hmm. you see? So, like, you know, some people are still warm, then, even though they're, they're, they're already dead. Or some have, people have been mistakenly buried. <laughs> yes, that's true, too. <laughs> but uh, the, so that's the first thing I would say is think about your eternal salvation. Think about where the priests are and, and park yourself there, no matter what the inconveniences may be. Uh, you know, that, that's the first thing I would say to do. So then you would have obviously make yourself known to those clergy. So when you call up or someone calls mm -hmm. up on your behalf, it's not, who is this person? I've never heard of you before. Yes, yes. That, that's, uh, you know, that it happens sometimes, you know. And uh, yes, you want to be registered with the local traditional parish and, and the, where the clergy know who you are. Uh, and uh, no surprises. No surprises. So those are things you could, you could say you have some kind of control over because you're either animated or maybe you have someone on your behalf. But after you, after you die, burial, funeral, these are things you, you have no control over because you're, you're not around. So what can you do to ensure that your will is still uh, being carried out despite your, not, your, your lack of physical presence? Well, in the first place, remember that your last will and testament is not read until you are long dead and buried. 
All right, so it, it means nothing to put the instructions of your burial in your last will and testament. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, you have to designate someone to have full control of your body when you die, and you have to fund them. That is, they have to have sufficient funds to bury you. And they have full control of what happens to your body, and all of your relatives must know that. So while you are still living, you must send a letter uh, to all of your relatives, and it would be better if it were notarized, uh, that you know, you're in your right mind, etc., that this is what I want. I want the body to be brought here and uh, you know, everything about the, uh, the wake, uh, the funeral, the priests that should conduct it, uh, and, uh, and distribution of funds to, you know, for covering the mass, what kind of mass you want, a high mass, low mass, uh, etc. Um, all of the details... Uh, and you must em empower somebody whom you trust and disempower, you might say, if that's an English word, those uh, members of your family who by law would have control over the body. In other words, you must be the next of kin. They might be pagans. They might be Novosordites. They might be Protestants. They, who knows what they're going to do? And you must be very specific about not being cremated, uh, but that you want to be buried in, in a certain place, and you have already picked it out, you have paid for it, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, Catholic cemetery, but it, uh, it be, would be better if it were. Uh, and uh, the, uh, But the priest can bless the grave, even in a secular cemetery. And... All of these things have to be pre-programmed and, as I said, funded too, because the person who pays the funeral director is the person that has control over the body. Uh, so the last will and testament, as I said, that's a whole other thing. Uh, uh, it's but, really for the estate and probate. It's, it's not really dealing yes. with such an immediate important thing. Yes. However, let me talk about that. You should put in your last will and testament some provision for uh, masses to be said for the uh, for the your soul in purgatory. That was for a deceased person. The idea being that perhaps you will have some purgatory to do, and it should be a uh, a reasonable um, amount according to your means. It should be uh, uh, designated according to the current stipend set by the. The congregation or, or association of priests, whatever it is that you want to be buried by, because that changes with time. You see, back in 1895, it was $1. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, and now it's $30, which is about what inflation would dictate. Uh, it was $2 in 1942. Mm. That I know from people who told me that. Two dollars. Two dollars, yes. Just shows how worthless the money is these yeah, days. Yeah, it's totally worthless. And, and so, uh, so you might, it might take you 20 years to die. And so in 20 years, inflation might go crazy as it is now. And, and uh, so you can't say, I, I you know, put this amount of... Uh, you put once. aside this amount of money and it will apply to however yes, many masses yes, that's, can be that's, said. Uh, uh, also, it should be a reasonable amount of masses. Uh, don't uh, gift the church with... Two hundred thousand dollars, saying I want these to apply to masses. Uh, the it would be very nice to gift the church with two hundred thousand dollars, but it, it would be very unfair to other people to put the burden upon priests to say two hundred thousand dollars of masses. You see that that's that'll take years. To I think I, I think sometimes you actually laymen forget <laughs> that it's a moral obligation. I know I know uh, one of the one of the priests in Europe. He won't take masses more than sixty days out because he says, "What happens if something happens to me and I have this moral obligation for these masses to be said? My brother priests are going to have to take that over." Yes, but that that's was typical. That's why the priest keeps very very clear records of his masses and checks off the ones that he has done because when he dies. The other priests will have to say those masses, but they take the stipends from his own estate, uh, from his the things that he leaves behind, etc. You know, there's a lot of valuable things that priests may have, 
And uh, so that's that's uh, he has to keep a very close record of those masses, and and he is obliged under pain of mortal sin to fulfill the masses that he accepts, and uh, and he is obliged to make sure that the priests who will have those masses later, you know, when he dies, will have will be able to be paid for those. So priests have to do their own estate planning. As they well. have to do their own estate planning now. You see, the, the organization, though, can accept many more masses than the individual priests. See, if, you're just, if your priest is just an individual, he can only go maybe 60 days. But the organization can, can take many masses, just like a diocese could or a parish could. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's, but don't, those don't overburden uh, the, the priests or the organization with, uh, with, and you're not really, when you do that, if you say I'm giving two hundred thousand dollars, but I'm going, I want masses to be said. You're not really giving anything to the church. What you're doing is is you're paying something in justice to the clergy. Yes, that's what you're doing, and it's a really kind of a loan to the church that it, little by little has to be paid off. You might say. Probably the layman's arguing. Well, you know, I'm worried about my purgatory time, Your Excellency. So I'm trying to make sure that <laughs> that's all handled. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so I mean that's that's just uh, that's rare, but you know somebody might think some people think that a, a, a mass stipend is a donation, and it is not. As a matter of fact, you cannot claim it on your taxes. Mm. It is two things: it is a, an offering to the priest for his upkeep. Also, it is an offering to God as a sacrifice, just as Our Lady and Saint Joseph offered the sacrifice when they presented Our Lord this little sacrifice. It, it, it is a participation, just as on Sunday you give some money. That is your participation in the sacrifice of the Mass, your personal sacrifice. So also, or when you light a candle, you put in some money. That covers not only the price of the candle, but you, you give something of yourself, which is maybe a few dollars, uh, as a sacrifice to God. See, so that's part of what the stipend is. Yeah, and I, I think I'm also thinking, Your Excellency, that the, the person who is giving this 200000 for Masses is not thinking about a, a, just a donation in and of itself, that that has its own effect. It doesn't necessarily say, okay, if you give this amount of money, you're going to get this kind of, of uh, time off of purgatory. That's not the point. The point is that that free will donation takes me back to our Lord watching the, the widow throw in that, that coin. She wasn't offering a stipend for Mass or anything like that. She was just making a, a gift, and that is uh, smiled upon, that generosity is smiled upon by our Lord. Yes, yes. And, you know, people, uh, you know, they, they obviously would like a lot of Masses for themselves and their relatives and everything, but there, there was a certain selfishness in saying, here's, here's this much money for Masses. That means everyone gets bumped out, mm. and nobody else can ask the priest for Masses for many, many years even. I, and I suppose that's good advice for people who have priests where there's only one or two priests in the area, and there's, well, I'd like to have 20 Masses said, and now they've blocked out yes, you know, yes. the Mass calendar for a while. So just something to think about, to be considerate of, of your, your fellow But by that, that I'm, uh, you know, it would be nice in your will to remember the church, especially the church that you're uh, involved in and where you, know, where you are, uh, but also the seminary. Uh, it would be nice to remember the seminary, too, because don't forget that the seminary lives off of the parishes, Seminary does not have its own parish. Uh, it might have a you know say mass for a limited number of people, but the uh, in in the old days the each parish would have to pay a tax to the diocese for the seminary. So uh, the seminary is the heart of the diocese. That was the old way, you know that the old axiom. It's the future. It's the future. So if if you have priests in your mass center, it's because there's a seminary training them, mm -hmm. and so remember the seminary always in your will. That would be very nice, too. So this notarized letter, and I, I'm, I'm assuming a copy would be sent to the clergy as well, maybe. A copy to the clergy, a copy to everyone involved. In other words, the whole family, so that no one can object and, you know, the, everyone knows what you want. And Father Chikata also, uh, he knew a lot about these things. He said you, that you should put in your will that anyone who has contested the uh, the instructions that I have given for my burial is um, is automatically cut out of the will. Hmm. Yes, you can do that. Okay. <laughs> well, I obviously we're speaking about U.S. law here, and so I would all of our our people who are watching and listening from around the world, you have to look at what the laws are in your country and your municipality. 
this this notarized document will hold up in in different states in the United States, in Your Excellency. Uh, well, it usually doesn't get to that. You you die on no Monday, you're buried by Thursday. You know, and okay. it's not going to get to that. It happens very quickly. Money talks. In other words, the person who has the money to bury you and to deal with the with the funeral director. They that's what it boils down to, and that's why you have to fund them. Mm. You know, you could somebody could hold up a piece of paper and say, "I'm supposed to take care of this," but they have no access to funds. So you have to fund them. It, it's interesting. I think you're actually. We not only have to have enough money to live; we have to have enough money to die. That's as right. Well. <laughs> that's right. My my mother's funeral cost fifteen thousand dollars. Wow, and that was yeah. some time ago. That was ten years ago, and now uh, she wanted to be buried in New York, so she had to be flown up to New York. But, um, but still, you know, it's it's expensive to die today. It's very expensive, you know. But you don't necessarily have to have a uh, a wake, you know. Also, I would put in the in these instructions that if for any reason these arrangements are impossible, you know, who knows because of COVID or who knows. Mm -hmm. Uh, that then I want only a civil burial. You see, and then you would make a, 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 a an arrangement with the priest ahead of time. You know, in that case, you know, could you say masses for me or something like that? And if you have any doubt that your your wishes will be carried out, also uh, uh, very very specific that you don't want to be cremated. You see. Uh, Cremation is popular because it's cheap, mm. and but you don't want to be cremated. You want to be buried, and uh, from you know, all the specifics, be as specific as possible. Well, it's in my uh, my father passed away in two thousand eighteen, and he didn't talk to us about these sorts of things. But when I was going through all of this with my mother, and uh, just as a side comment, I think some of those burial preparations helps you move your move through emotionally that time period. I have to do this. We've got to work on the headstone and the family galvanizes yes. and moves forward but they were trying to sell you know the fancy caskets you know would you like this one with you know special pearl handles and you just like no we want the simplest possible we're not going to be upsold on a casket this is just the body is is where it is it's going to be resurrected one day but you don't need to get the fancy casket also determine what music you want at your hmm. if any and what you don't want in other words now they're singing your, your favorite broadway song as uh, you're, you're you know being wheeled in and uh, as the priest says you're making spaghetti in heaven or you're you know mowing the lawn in heaven or something like that <laughs> right, something with the really mass of the stupid mass of the angels maybe yes. <laughs> <laughs> so i think part of this caution and all of that experience that you heard his excellency share also even redounds when we've seen this happen to traditional catholic clergy yes yes mm -hmm. i've seen that I know a case uh, of a priest who confided his arrangements to a, a layperson, and that layperson insisted that he take away the arrangements from clergy who knew uh, this priest. And uh, and I don't really know what happened after that, but I I, I know the the layperson involved was not uh, how would you say entirely in our theological camp. I'll mm. say that. Mm. So we have a lot of work to do. You have to get ready for dying, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a full assignment. I, I'm just looking at all the notes I made here. It would take at least, I would say, a f maybe half a day or, or a full Saturday to just go through, get all this done. And then, as you say, you never know when you're going to die, but maybe to start a savings account that would be tied to this person that you designate and just start to put some money into it. You don't necessarily have yes. to fund it all right now, but money needs to be going into it. Yes, yes. It's uh, something to, to take care of. Uh, and uh, many people die intestate, you know, without a last will, and they also die without any instructions about their burial. They get carted, or even though they are died in the wool traditionalists, wouldn't be caught literally dead in a Novus Ordo church. They get carted off to the Novus Ordo church, and there they are singing the Broadway shows in, in the, the white casket and everything like that and, and making spaghetti in heaven and all the other trash and garbage. Well, and, I mean, these days you can get traditional confirmations in Nova Soto churches, I'm told. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's another. <laughs> well, so, uh, I, that's it. yes, it's something absolutely to take care of. And, and you never know when you're going to die. 
uh, you know, you can die in a car accident. You can, you can, there's many ways. Uh, uh, just recently, we saw many people shot in Maine. Uh, they were in a restaurant. How, how did they think? Or in a relatively calm town in Maine. Maine has a very low, uh, I think the lowest in the whole country, criminal criminality rate. There's, it's just one of the safest places in the country. And probably the last things on their mind uh, eating out was that somebody was going to come in and shoot them, shoot them dead. Uh, and you just don't know how you're going to go and when. So it's you, you don't wait until you're 85 to do this, in other words. You, you do it uh, even when you're in your 30s and 40s and uh, uh, you start that funding of it. I, I'm I'm thinking through the mechanics of it now. You're seeing it actually probably spurs a lot of interesting conversations. The way that couples prepare for marriage and think who's going to be invited and who isn't, and mm -hmm. right, well, we've got the Protestant relatives. What's going to happen there? And thinking about well, who can I entrust to carry out you know this for me in, in the way that I think about things? It, it's quite an undertaking. So, in in this month of November, as we're praying for those who have already passed, we should also give a thought to ourselves to start this preparation. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for helping to answer this question that came in. And if you have questions for the rector, you can just put that hashtag questions for the rector and at MHT Seminary. And when it's appropriate and when His Excellency is available, uh, we'll be able to answer them. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you.